This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. Our guest tonight is Ava Reedkees, Mexican filmmaker, studied anthropology and literature at Princeton. She has an MFA in film from NYU. Incredible independent, hardworking artist who's directed five feature films, documentaries, fiction films, now developing a variety of TV series. She's written for Narcos, the um, still writing for Narcos, and some of the titles of her, of her films are The Favor, Santa Morte, which is the saint that all the Narcos um, worship, which is basically a skeleton in a Madonna costume, and anybody that has hard luck or is criminal basically worships her. There's an incredible documentary called Children of the Streets, which documents just the heartbreaking stories of so many lost children that are just thrown out because they, they their parents can't even afford them or they, they're, they're being abused. Uh, Taxidermy, The Art of Imitating Life, Billy Twist, Chewy the Wolfman, which is about a family in Mexico, you know, that are like the wolfmen. They are covered in hair. It's, she's just an incredible uh, human rights and animal rights activist. I'm just a lovely, lovely gal. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin. I'm Ava Reedkees. Good evening, Eva. Good to have you here, darling. This is the Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl. And we're very excited to have you here because you're working on some very interesting projects as of late. Many things seem to be coming your way in 2019. You've been writing for Narcos, the latest series. Yeah. How does that feel? Uh, it's, been, it's been great. The writers are really good. Um, I have two TV shows of my own, so I'm learning how the writer's TV writer's room works, and I'm from a film background. Obviously, it's a very different process. You have six to eight writers in the room, all sort of working on the same season, the same episodes. People don't know that there's so many writers on TV episodes, and um, knowing Jerry Stahl, and he's written for CSI and various other things. Jerry, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Stahl. Yep. Jerry, Jerry. Um, it's got to be kind of a mind fuck unless you're with the right people. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, you know, there's definitely a hierarchy in the room, the showrunner and the, the original writers and then the newcomers. I was the only Spanish speaker in the room. And it's the, and, and it's Narcos. Yeah. Why, why, why did they, um, how did you get invited to, to partake in that? Uh, well, I did a, another writer's room earlier in the year. My yeah. eight, my, it, it was called, it's a show called Mexico City. They're filming it now. It's about CIA agents in Mexico City. Are you an expert in that as well as many other things? They're chasing a narco who worships the La Santa Muerte. Which you are an expert in. Yes. So this is a full circle. We want to take this one at a time. So you were working on the show called Mexico City. What was it called? Mexico City, yeah. Okay. CDMX. CIA and Santa Muerte. Yeah. So um, I did a feature documentary about La Santa Muerte, sort of the first film about it. And um, can you describe from, exactly what that is, please, for those that don't uh, that don't worship her? Even though I do have, thank you very much, your gift, her figurine in my kitchen, watching Nova. Tell us about the skinny girl. I mean, it's a religious cult. Uh, she's about ten million followers now. Oh my god! Um, they're not quite sure where it started, but the the most likely scenario is the late 90s in Mexico City and it's basically she's people, a skeleton dressed as a Madonna yeah, a mm-hmm. female grim reaper um, <laughs> that's worshipped as a saint so it's people worshipping death as a female saint and um, essentially her followers are asking her for protection From against death? against herself so it's people to protect who, me against you oh, my <laughs> lovely <laughs> sister in the veil so it's people who live, you know, a dangerous lifestyle or in danger of dying, sick people. Narcos, drug Nar- traffickers, yeah, criminals, criminals, people These in jail, gang members, um, drug, drug addicts. When did you do this policemen. film and how can people see it? Tell us about the film itself. So that's the subject you covered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, were, you filmed it in Mexico City. What year was that? 2006. How did you find financing for that? Uh, just with grants in Mexico. Fantastic. Right. Is it? It's a feature-length film? Yes. Yeah. And where can, can people see it? Is it on Vimeo, YouTube? It's, it's on Vimeo, yeah, on, on my page, Ava Ritke, so all my films are there. Fantastic. How did, how, how did that work? So how did you even get interviews with drug lords, with criminals, with people in prison? I mean, good job, sister. 
You, uh, are you sure you're not in the CIA? Hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, El Chavo with uh, with Sean Penn. I mean, yeah. the, there's a, a there's a level of narcissism, I think, with a lot of these people that they actually do like some level of exposure because yeah. it's so irrational. Yeah, I mean, the the religious fervor I witnessed is unlike any other. I mean, these people, very they, they're yeah. very, very okay. devoted to her. They all swear that she's performed miracles for them. You know, a lot of them said, well, I used to pray to St. Jude Thaddeus, you know, who's like the patron saint of lost causes and difficult situations. We've and all prayed like, there, honey. They're like, and St. Jude didn't help me, but La Santa Muerte did. Um, they call wow. her La Flaquita, the skinny one, the La Niña Blanca, the white girl, it's so um, interesting. La Santissima. And I want to, you know, Catholicism, and, and, you know, you see it with, with the Italians as well, with the mobsters. It's just psychopathic behavior that goes along with that that choice of life yeah. and then angry, and then really, angering and hungering down at church and then right, religious really. yeah. and then a religious need to fill the god hole yeah. with it's, something like does it matter how many murders or how many crimes yeah. they've committed or if they're in prison but they still then have this need as if it, God is all forgiving. Well, that's the idea is that she doesn't discriminate. Like right, death takes she is everyone, death. you know, the rich and the poor, the young and the soon. old, the good and the bad. She doesn't, she doesn't discriminate. She, she accepts everyone. And the Catholic church in Mexico consider her, this worship satanic. Oh, okay. That makes they sense. They say, you know, death is the enemy of Christ. I consider he, he all religions satanic, but then that's just me. I think it's all, you know, I think that people do have a God hall. There are some people that need religion, that mm -hmm. li literally there is a space in the brain that needs to be filled. Um, and I, and I, I think this is all across all cultures. Yeah. And I think that people need to believe that there's something yep. more than this life. They, they, they can't face the fact that maybe there isn't. And, yeah. You know, my, I mean, my beliefs are, look, we're all energy. We transmit, we transmute into something, but we're not going to see a white man with a beard and a robe yeah. or a dark man in a beard with, or a skinny girl in a Madonna outfit waiting for us outside of those gates. She's I mean, they're, they're asking her to not take them or if she does to give them like a peaceful, nonviolent death. And, you know, it's a pagan, it's, it's okay. a syncretism. I mean, they consider themselves Catholic. Right. And it's, it's a syncretism between Catholicism and pagan religions where you're worshiping natural phenomena. Yep. You know, uh, wind or Earth, fire, fire or, or you know, or death. Or death. Life. Um, but all the rituals are Catholic, including, you know, the idol, you know. And she has many costumes. People, like people will saint. make incredible costumes yeah. for uh, these figurines of her. Yeah. And sometimes she will be, I mean, it'd be like life size with yeah, these yeah. elaborate costumes, like costing thousands of dollars, bejeweled mm -hmm. and decorated, dressing up a skeleton. Yeah. So the, so which the main we all character. Are and will become. The main character in the film is a woman named Enriqueta Romero Romero, who put this life-size resin skeleton outside of her house in an altar and people started worshiping and Big coins. you know so i started filming there and you know if people if she did a granted a favor for people they'd send mariachis to sing to her or uh, aztec dancers to dance for her wow uh, people doing pre-hispanic dances you know just the people that would come through there like a lot of like transsexual prostitutes gang members, like people carrying, you know, crippled children that were dying. Just so to disenfranchise to people her. in general. Yeah, find, people yeah. who don't feel accepted by the Catholic Church. Right. People who are desperate. Yeah. And through there, you know, once I was there, I, I um, befriended this cobbler um, who... That was amazing who, seeing <laughs> leads the masses like there's you know public every Saturday night there's a public mass where hundreds of people bring their Santa Muertes mm -hmm. from home to be blessed and by Enriqueta and by him then there was another man who lived in the neighborhood in Tepito which is sort of the most dangerous neighborhood in Mexico City okay. it's always even in Aztec times it was like where the it's thieves so the works. thieves had their markets of like stolen goods right. and now it's all like you know, that's where you go if you want to buy guns or, Whatever. you know, counterfeit electronics or That's where um, we are not drugs. performing a concert. Kind <laughs> of I don't think so. So this guy who lived nearby, you know, makes dresses for her and people would hire him to make dresses for their Santa Muertes. And he'd make these, he makes these very elaborate dresses. And then I met this other woman there whose daughter was in jail and um, so, she, I mean, really, one one cultist would lead to another. Yeah, so. and that's how it is with documentaries. Right. Like, it's kind of like. Do you think it was easier detective. because you were a woman? Well, first of all, you yeah. you speak the language. You were yeah. from Mexico City, and you were a woman, so maybe people felt more faith in you. 
that. Yeah, I think more I think being a woman definitely helps if you're making documentary films. Like people inherently trust you more; they're less suspicious. Interesting. My first documentary was about street kids in Mexico City. What year was that, and what was the title? of That, that was 2001. Uh, Niños de la calle, children of the street. A lot of inhal- inhalants, that whole thing. Like yeah, uh, they were all like uh, brain dead. They at were age, all like seven. huffing yeah. something called activo, which is like a mixture of turpentine thinner right. and thin- thinner. And some of them were smoking crack also. Right. Was and it true, you know, I was reading around that time, was it true that, um, and I don't know if it's just folklore, cops were rounding them up and, and killing them? and, and uh, just Not, to not of, killing them, but, okay. you know, there, there was violence, definitely. They were clearing them from public parks. Yeah. When, the, when the Pope came to Mexico, like in 2002 or three, they cleared, you know, this park downtown where, where there was a, one of the groups that I was filming, you know, and like force them all to go into shelters so the Pope wouldn't see these, oh my God. these street kids. It, it's so insane when you, you're seven years old and you're so feral yeah. and, and, and just the, the will to want to still survive. I, I, saw, I saw something recently about North Korea and like kids huddled around like an oil drum warming themselves up in the middle of the winter mm-hmm. at five years old yeah. and just, just like raising themselves like what? You grow yeah. up pretty fucking fast in those situations. These kids had all run away from home. Right. You know, a lot of them were from the slums of Mexico City, really poor families, you know, with lots of kids. The parents right. couldn't feed them, right. weren't really making sure they were going to school. A lot, most of these situations, there was an abusive father or maybe the father was in the States working and right. they were left with grandparents or uncles or some of them were kicked out because they were gay and they, they wind up on the street and then they wind up becoming drug addicts right. and then they want to stay there. And uh, so it was actually with the street kids in 2001 that I f- saw my first image of La Santa Muerte. Like one of the kids in okay. my movie was right. wearing a necklace. And I was like, well, you know, what is that? And he was like, oh, it's La Santa Muerte. You know, and then I started seeing her image everywhere, like right. in, you know, stickers on taxis. Her, yes. And it was the period that it was, it was really, co- really coming up at that point. Mm-hmm. And so, so is that common that a, one documentary leads to another? I mean, do you, coming out or ending a documentary, you have like five mm-hmm. documentaries in your mind and mm-hmm. the wings from that point on? Is that kind of how you roll? I mean, in this case, it was. Yeah. I tend to go back and forth between like documentaries and fiction. Oh. Uh, like I'll do a documentary and I don't do documentaries about f- subjects that I know really well and I have an opinion about that I want to like, you Cause, know, cause, impose cause you like on the world. Too, too subjective at that point? Is it? Yeah, well, it's just kind of my thing. Like I do them on something I'm really interested in that I don't know anything about. Cool. And I want to find out and I sort of learn about it while I'm making the film. Did you ever encounter any violence or feel endangered while you were doing these documentaries? These are heavy subjects. I mean, you're a beautiful young mm-hmm. woman and how big was your crew, mm-hmm. first of all? I mean, it was usually three, like me and a DP and, and a sound recordist. And you might be safer that way, actually. Yeah. You might actually, I mean, I yeah. often find that women actually are safer in some countries than men mm-hmm. for some reason. I don't know mm-hmm. why. I know that seems like contradictory, but I sometimes feel that it's easier for a woman to walk around, especially, um, look, we know how much rape and murder happens yeah. everywhere, and especially, yeah. in, I mean, everywhere. Yeah. In this country, all countries. But sometimes I think in some danger zones, yeah. there's almost respect. Like, who the hell are you and what are you doing here? Yeah. And if you don't have a big crew, I think it can be more dangerous for two men sometimes than two women. So did you ever encounter, like, hairy situations? That you're I mean, like, when we were oh, filming the, too much. the Santa Muerte documentary in Tepito, like, you know, we strayed away from the altar and we're filming in the neighborhood and we went to this, the woman who had the daughter in jail that I then... Through that, went started filming in the jails. When we were filming in her neighborhood, like it, it's kind of like a, it's called a vecindad. It's like a little apartment complex. There was like a group of of uh, like a gang members that were there waiting for us outside to kind of steal the camera. Yeah. But then right. she said to them like, "Oh, they're doing a documentary about La Santa Muerte and, and, and with Enriqueta's off. blessing, and you know they all worship her, so right. they kind of left us alone." Right. And then when I was filming in the jails, I filmed in um penitentiary for men that were in there for like murder and kidnapping and kind of very serious crimes then i filmed in the another jail for young men that were there for theft and stuff like that and there was a special section in there for for young gay men 
Um, well, and again, these are but, voices that are not often heard, and their yeah. story needs to be told. I mean, and this is probably why they want to tell. They need yeah. to tell their story. Yeah. I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, all right, I think I'm going to be a gang-banging murderer today. You become yeah. that for reasons that are way beyond your control. Nobody wakes up and thinks, I'm going to beat my girlfriend up or murder someone today unless they've been battered into that condition and unless society has forced them into a corner where crime is the only solution. Yeah. I mean, they I all mean, claim to be innocent, but yeah. Yeah, they are. Well, and then none we filmed of us in, are in the, in the all, women's all guilty prison. until proven innocent in my book, but we, then again, I never felt yeah. guilty. I would imagine it would, maybe if you ever ran into a little danger, it would be with the kids. I mean, I always say, people always say, well, who are the biggest psychopaths? Who are the most dangerous? Well, yeah. When I was a child interacting yeah. with kids, and, and yeah. they're either dead or they're in jail at this point. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, if I'm ever nervous, which I'm not, but yeah. if I'm walking late at night somewhere in some weird city, yeah, a teenagers drove, can be the most of, dangerous. Twelve-year-old boys yeah. is like, that's, yeah, that's they're, they're impulsive. They feel, you no know, respect for basically the life. I think, or, or yeah, who knows? They don't on. have a sense no of sense. consequences, right. and like, but you're, 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 you're you never run it. Uh, with, with the street the kids. kids, it was it was heavy in a different way. Yeah, you know, uh, like one of the girls that I, one of the the female protagonists in that film. Her and her friend had been like gang raped by policemen. Yeah. One of them was pregnant and was oh, like that's good. cops doing, the other people, I'm you know, doing <laughs> doing drugs when she was pregnant. Her baby died, you know, shortly I was born. And then one of the boys had cancer, oh. and you know he was just on the street and it was getting worse and worse. Uh, and he had to have his leg amputated. Uh, and ultimately, like while I was filming, he died of cancer. It's you know metastasized and. There it was more dilemma, like, he was inviting me to his, you know, he wanted to see me, and I was going to his house to see him, and I was like, I don't know, do I film this or not? It was kind of a moral dilemma. Okay. Like, I don't want to be exploitative wanna... in any way. Okay. But then I was like, but this is the reality. Yeah, like, true. I'm making a documentary about the situation, about these kids. Half of them don't make it to the age of 25. Right. Uh, they OD, or they're, they, yeah. you know, they get run over, they get, you know, drive AIDS or some other illness. Does it take you a long time to recuperate after filming something like this and being so close to these people that are basically hopeless? I mean, yeah. they know their life is going to end. How could they yeah. not worship someone that represents yeah. death? Yeah. I mean, did you have, did it take a lot of recovery from, from the, the Santa Morte film? Uh, the Santa Muerte one, not really. More the street kids one. Well, I mean, I think for some a job like what you do, and I know with Lydia and I touring and stuff, just yeah. just artists and 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 creators like ourselves, the amount of compartmentalization that you have to kind of create or do, it's mm -hmm. just like you come back from a tour, you're like, oh, just just, yeah. just how to compartmentalize is very difficult. Yeah. And, but it's part of the it's part of the job. I mean, I you know when I'm making a documentary, I try and be objective, and I kind of see my role almost like the role of a journalist. Right. I'm showing what I'm seeing. And, you know, ultimately with the boy that was dying, like I did film him sort of on his deathbed because I was like, this is the reality. This is it's this reality. is what happens to a lot of these kids. This is how they went, end up. And, you know, one of them was like, oh, I'm going to go home. Like, I'm going to get off the street. And I filmed at their houses too. Like I went to three of their homes and, you know, cause you just hear like, oh, my parents, it's their fault. But then you go to the homes and you see the other side of it, especially the, the, mo the long suffering mothers, you know, sure. who are like just can, can you tell us suffering again where, so much, where, where, like where not knowing where their children are, absolutely. you know, and yeah, if they're yeah. alive or dead. And, and can you tell us one more time where people can see these films? Um, I have a page on Vimeo with my five features there that you can rent for like four dollars, and yeah, there's uh, Nino, it's Children of the Street is there, La Santa Muerte, which is narrated by Gael Garcia Bernal. Uh, the Children of the Street one was nominated for two Mexican Academy Awards, and then my other, my third documentary, Chewy the Wolfman, about a, a Mexican family with hypertrichosis right. or, which is or when, werewolf which is syndrome. Right when you're yeah, yeah, fully covered in hair. Um, it's kind of like, and that's a family from Zacatecas. Uh, there's 15 of them: men, women, children, and I'm babies. Familiar, yeah, yeah who have, you know, hair on their face. It's sort of a family portrait of, you know, they le lead very difficult lives. Like as kids, they're made fun of, so they drop out of school. And then when they grow up, they can't find work because they have no education, the way they look. So they, most of them wind up working in circuses, you know, exhibiting that's themselves. The only yeah, yeah, no, I saw, yeah. So, so I, I, I want to touch on, on your history, but before mm -hmm. we, I still want to touch on just the danger of the job. So, what about the Narcos mm -hmm. guy that got killed in. Uh, oh, the location scout? You, yeah, the location yeah. scout. That was just a bad, wrong place at the wrong time? Or they what? don't know. You know, they don't know if it's related to the show. Uh, they think it was probably, you know, the state of Mexico. Mexico City is kind of like Washington, D.C. It's right. like the capital, and it's surrounded by other states. 
And Estado de Mexico has become extremely dangerous. It's one of the states that borders Mexico City. You know, there's a lot of women that are turning up murdered there. And he was driving around there on his own, okay. looking for locations. So, you know, who knows what he encountered right. or, or saw. You know, I mean, they could have just been like, oh, who's this nosy kid? No one really no, knows. No, you don't know. You don't know. What, when, you know. When, what was your uh, time span in Mexico City? Were you born in Mexico City? Uh, Netherlands. Yeah, Netherlands. I was born in Holland. Uh, my father's a poet, but and a po- novelist. Actually, poetry in Holland at one point was very big. It's come <laughs> yeah, off the, the Rotterdam Poetry Festival. I used to be at that poetry festival myself. Yeah. There used to be a lot of poetry in the 80s in, in, in Holland. Um, Maybe I performed with your dad. <laughs> Maybe. Hmm. In Latin America, there's, you know, intellectuals are very highly respected and they're often given diplomatic posts. So, so why were you born in Holland? Because my father was Mexican ambassador but, to, yeah. to the Netherlands. So I was oh, born oh, in The hello. Hague when, when he was there. And he was that. also ambassador in Switzerland and then at the UNESCO in Paris. Carlos Fuentes was in France. Octavio Paz was in India. So there's this sort of tradition whenever there's some big event, like the journalists will call up the writers to get their opinion you know, it's it's not like here where right. You know, culture like, is, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No. culture's on the tail. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the last thing on the list. <laughs> so, so I was born there, and I I grew up there uh, till I was five, and then my father was like, you know, I want to go back to Mexico. I'm tired of the diplomatic service. I just want to write. I want to go back, and then I was in Mexico City from six to eighteen. And then I came here to the States for college and, and film school after So, so you, um, you got into Princeton, which is mm-hmm. a very good school, obviously, we all know. Did you want to study in the States specifically, or what, what made you want to just start applying to all these American universities? Uh, well, my mother's from New York. Okay. My mother's American. Yeah. Uh, my father's Mexican. So she'd always decided that me and my sister should study in the States right. and, you know, and get like a sort of traditional, well-rounded liberal arts education. And your sister is an acclaimed writer as well. She lives yeah. in London and she just yeah. has a book out coming, a new, another book out right yeah, now. Yeah, she's, she's presenting it. Yeah, Wednesday at McNally Jackson, Sea Monsters. <laughs> Chloe, yeah. Um, so literature, writing definitely runs in the family. My mother's a translator. I guess I was the black sheep by going into film, but I, you know, I do write a lot of writing. Well, what is film if not were if not poetry? Yeah. yeah, put to image. Well, that was the thing. Like I grew up reading and writing and painting and doing photography and video and you know music so it all came and, together, and right? yeah. it was the way of I couldn't choose between these different mediums. Well, and, and film, and film was with combining every, all of them. All of it. I mean, and that's that's the beauty yeah. of film, whether it's documentary or or the you know mm-hmm. the most abstract or. Hardcore. I mean, it's it's bringing everything together, it's, and that's why it's the most difficult art yeah. form. Actually, there are a ridiculous amount of amazing films, and there are yeah. a ridiculous amount of terrible films. Yeah. And how mm-hmm. one is differentiated? There's, I mean, because it involves so many people. Yeah, that everybody has to be on the same, trusted, with the same page. I mean, I've worked on two disaster films that I just thought were mm-hmm. should have been good, but weren't. Yeah. I mean, I I think that the films I did in the um, late seventies, early eighties, which were super eight with low budget, were far more um, artistically successful yeah. than when I worked on other people's big budget films because you have to have trust in all of the right and there's so many people involved how does yeah. anyone even make a masterpiece I mean it's it's tough I've <laughs> definitely had many moments from like why did I choose this you know like a musician can do their music a painter can do their paintings a writer can write you still depend on the gallery and the record label and the publisher to get your work out there but at least you can do your work like with film you need so much money, so many people. You're stymied you know, so much of the way. You're, 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 you're at the back. mercy of other people basically giving you permission to do it. You know, unless you're like Stan Brackage and just doing like a one-man show, like short experimental films. So, you know, that's where documentaries definitely give you much more freedom because you need a very small crew. You don't need a huge budget. Uh, most of the budget is actually in post-production. You know, the editing goes on for, I can imagine. you know, at least a year. Yeah. Well, you have so I much still footage. feel documentaries are extremely important because yeah. that is the that is the ba- the blood of life. Yeah. yeah, that that is the bones of reality. Yeah, and it's you know the same reason why I write nonfiction. It's the same yeah. reason that I write memoirs or political speeches or talk about even if it's the same thing. Like most writers who just are on the same theme, I try to find different languages to express it in, which is basically the imbalance of power, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the dystopic mindset, mm-hmm. hate fucking, uh, love lost, you know, the disenfranchised. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like I'm a journalist or a hysterian. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter what format my art is taking, because I'm still kind of a documentarian, yeah. at least of my attempt at sanity through the insanity of everything around me. Mm-hmm. 
what's coming up now? So it, let's just go back a minute. You went to school, then you went back to Mexico to make your documentaries. Mm-hmm. And you got some grants to do that. So now you have some documentaries under your belt. What happens next? Well, I went to Princeton, studied uh, literature and anthropology, kind of led into, I think, fiction, narrative and documentary films. And then I went straight from Princeton to NYU for film school to do a master's. And I did, my, I did several shorts there. Two of them were at Sundance. Um, at Princeton, my mentor was P. Adam Sidney, who was one of the founders of Anthology Film Archives. I was his assistant for three years, you know, projecting films, cleaning them, repairing them, and uh, helping him do research. Yeah, and then at NYU, after I graduated from NYU, I did my Niños de la Calle. I did, the, for the past 20 years, the five features, like pretty much four years each. I raised all the money, I produced them, I and edited. that is a, an immense job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that, and, that, and that is, I mean, it is something that you can find people to help you, but basically you are on the trail hunting yeah. Yeah. nonstop to try to get your vision. Yeah. Brought. What, what film are you most happy with? I mean, they're all different. You know, I'm less critical of the documentaries because obviously the fiction ones, there's more of me in them. You know, I wrote the scripts and they're, whereas the documentaries aren't about me at all. You know, they're, they're all about marginalized communities and misfits. And, you know, my two fiction films, you know, I'm proud of them, but I see them, I'm like, oh, you know, next time I'll do better. <laughs> you know, like, Titles. You know, it's, Titles. Uh, the, the first was called The Favor. Uh, it's the only one that I shot in the States. And it's about this man whose uh, ex-girlfriend dies in a freak accident. He winds up adopting her teenage son that she had with deadbeat father and the kid comes to live with him and wreaks havoc in his home. And, you know, it's kind of an indie drama. It was at festivals. It's had a run at the quad and it was on the Sundance channel. And the other one's called uh, Los Ojos Azules, The Blue Eyes. And it's about an American couple who go to Chiapas, Mexico and encounter a shape-shifting witch <laughs> who, you know... Has blue eyes? Uh, <laughs> well, no, the blue eyes is a... Uh, it's the backstory. Uh, the young man in this couple, his grandfather was an anthropologist who was studying the Tzotzil Indians in Mexico and impregnated this young Indian woman and then left her and she, you know, the baby was born and it had blue eyes and she killed the baby and blue eyed uh, devil got it. Cut out its blue eyes, which she wears in a little jar around okay. her neck. Oh. Another and she, happy. Was, she was banned from the village, and she sells, like, you know. How did that do in Mexico? She sells, <laughs> she sells jewelry at the market, and then this young couple go, and this kid is, like, a spitting image of his grandfather, and she winds up turning him into a dog, a blue-eyed, oh. a blue-eyed dog. Blue-eyed, I love Fine. blue-eyed dogs. But she also turns herself into a dog and vultures and So, I mean, this is kind things. of a theme you're developing in, in another film that you have uh, on the burner here. Uh-huh. You have this animal, human to animal fixation. Yeah. Animals. Yeah. <laughs> human animal human hybrids. Human animals, yeah. human animal hybrids. What, what's, so you know, carry on in this subject. You have a project you're working on that's sci fi, mm-hmm. transmutational. I don't even know what to call it. Animal you, rights, environmental rights. Animal rights, yeah. and environmental rights. Tell, tell us a little bit about it, if you, if you don't mind, just giving us the concept. Uh, well, it's a, it's a movie I tried to make for 20 years, Animalia. I wrote the first draft in 1999, and I was going to make it with some Mexican producers, and they fucked me over, and then I was going to make it with Vice, and they kind of fucked me over. I and know they're 50 million in debt, <laughs> which I mean, no. I don't know, oh, they, they've, they've laundered all that money, those groups. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Go ahead. And now it's going to be a TV series. Excellent. Um, yeah. So give us just the theme of it. It's about human-animal hybrids. You know, my grandfather was Greek. I always loved Greek mythology. I always loved, like, the hybrid creatures, like the Minotaur. Yep. You know, the Minotaur was depicted as a monster. (laughs) But I said, well, what's it like for him to be half man, half animal? Let's hear about the monsters. You know, the labyrinth is, like, not just a physical prison. It's, like, an existential prison. He doesn't know what he is or who he is. And so it sort of started with that concept. The main character is the bull man. But I was like, no, I want to put it in a modern setting. So there's a lot of them all related to different animals. There's, you know, a hyena man and a dolphin woman and a roadrunner woman and a leopard woman and a, an owl man and um, so, so the an werewolf, elephant man. Where, you know, it's interesting because I'm trying to th- look at the thread. Obviously, yeah. fiction and documentaries are different satisfactions or different, pro- you know, a different process. And you, and you are active in both. Yeah. 
Would you say the yeah. werewolf syndrome kind of <laughs> led you the into wolf, that? The yeah. wolf man. Wolf 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 people? Uh, yes, in the sense of like with this project Animalia, I didn't want them to be like superhero. You know, they have like health problems. They do have highly advanced senses like from the animals. Amazing. You know, smell yeah. and vision and hearing. But they're basically real life freaks living in the real world. Yeah. They were the product of a failed experiment. And it's sort of what their life is like. You know, like they're they're the link between human and non-human animals. It's also mythology and, and yeah, like shape-shifting and, well, and I mean, these hybrid Indian, creatures that Indian are part of all mythologies. Too, right. Indian yeah. culture too, as well as Greek. I mean, we have like Ganesh and we have, you know, all kinds of gods and goddesses that have monkey gods, rat gods. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's just very prevalent in other cultures yeah. that, I mean, not, not necessarily, but that have human characteristics. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of men that have animal characteristics, <laughs> but not animalistic <laughs> enough for me. God, I don't know why. Anyway. <laughs> so that's a possibility that's mm-hmm. coming soon. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be uh, pitching that project next month. So are you finished with Narcos? I don't know. <clears throat> Probably not. I mean, th- we're waiting to see if it's renewed for another season. You know, it's it's going to continue in Mexico for a few seasons because, you know, the, sadly... The, the baton's been passed. There, there's, many, <laughs> there's many seasons worth of uh, story... In Mexico. Who yeah. inspired you as both a documentary filmmaker and just in films in general? I mean, who were you, you know, okay, say you're 15, 16, you, you have artistic parents, you're watching films. What really turned you on at that point? Um, I've always loved Werner Herzog, who, you know, is one of the Makes only sense. ones who really goes back and forth between documentaries and fiction. Yep. Jim Jarmusch actually... Uh, played an important role in my life. Uh, When I was 12, uh, my father had a fellowship from the DAD, from the DAAD in Berlin. Mm. This is in 1986, and we spent the summer there. And my mother had read something about Jim Jarmusch, and they were showing his three, the three films he had made at that point, which was Permanent Vacation, Down by Law, and and Stranger in Paradise, back-to-back in the small cinema. And we went to see them, like all three. And I kept the flyer, and, and I was like, oh, wait, like... This is poetic, funny, cool, like, you know, these great characters. And then between Princeton and NYU, I did like a summer class at NYU. I had to make five short films in five weeks. And I found his address in the phone book. And I sent him these five shorts. And I said, you know, I'd I'd love to work with you. And he wrote me this handwritten letter, like two pages, saying... You know, your films remind me of Man Ray and oh, Maya Dar- right? Darren and filmmaking really needs some new blood. And um, I just finished a very difficult film, which was Dead Man. Yep. I guess Johnny Depp was a handful at the time. And he was going to do like the Neil Young documentary after that. But he was <laughs> like, you know, I'll keep your letter, your films and keep you in mind. But that letter meant a lot to me. You know, it was like sort of validation, like, OK, here's this filmmaker that was important to me who's. You know, yeah, that, that's who great. That kind of my work yeah. and like sat down and watched my films and. Um, well, being and encouraged is, is is always great, especially with people that you highly respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, yeah, you basically you weren't you didn't look back at at that point. You just kept on going. So I, you know, I always ask, especially with with artists mm-hmm. and or just people in the, in the creative world, the whole admin side. I mean, I in a perfect world, I'd be doing music all the time, but I find myself doing. 70% administrative yeah. crap. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm always trying to refine that and figure out how to get back to the creative, you know, get more of the creative. And of course, the more I take on, the more I do, the more that piles up. And I'm just curious, how do you, how do you manage it all? I mean, I guess there's not an easy answer to that. I mean, it's a full-time job, you know, like that's, Beyond a that's one job. of the things that's been really nice about this Narcos job past six months is I was just focused on, on writing yep. for this one show. I didn't have to worry about any of the, you know, financial or production side of it. How I was just focused oh. on one creative aspect. You know, producing all my own films, the the advantage was that I had total creative freedom. Yep. Uh, the disadvantage is I had no one helping me. I Once know. the films were made, get them out in the world. You know, submitting to festivals, getting distribution, totally. looking over contracts. Like, I did all of that myself. And, you know, now I have a four-year-old daughter, so... I can't really spend four years on a movie doing everything and for ten thousand dollars and right. you know or whatever hopefully, I paid hopefully myself. Hopefully, you won't have to. You know? Maybe twenty nineteen is all the big spin around for all of us. Well, so films were films were your priority. What kind of music were you listening to at the time as well? 
that period. So you're getting into Jim Jarmusch at 12. Yeah. <laughs> Same year I got into Bowie and the Stooges. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, in, you know, in high school, I was kind of a goth. You know, I, I always loved Susie and the Banshees and Joy Division and the Sister of Mercy. My sister and I ran the Smiths fan club in Mexico for two years. Um, Who are was, huge in Mexico. I mean, Morrissey is Well, super... they never played in Mexico. Oh, well, Morrissey, Morrissey yeah, plays yeah. there all the time. So, right. like... <clears throat> better the Smiths you know, or the Robert time, Smith. No, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> say From 87 something. to 89, like, which is when we ran the fan club, there weren't that many Smiths fans in Mexico. I was um, never a Smiths fan, but I wasn't even a Robert Smith fan, but I have to say that Robert Smith did engrave a message to me on one of his early records, uh, to the Queen of Siam. Somebody asked me if I had ever had sex with Robert Smith. I'm like, I don't have sex with pandas. Are you kidding me? I do love The Cure, I have to say. Well, I, do love I did the like cure. pornography, and I'm not just talking about their early record. I like, yeah. that, I like that there were rivals, uh, Morrissey. Oh, and made, that's no so funny. made no sense. Made no sense. Made no sense. Um, and, you know, I always loved the Velvet Underground, yep. uh, David Bowie, Brian Eno. You know, I went through a mod phase, listened to a lot of 60s, you know, garage and psych music, glam, you know, All of it. disco, reggae. You have thousands funk, of records you know, at your house, honey. I've seen it. 3,000, yeah. Oh, I DJed like, for, nice. I DJed around the city for like almost 20 years also. Holy moly. Yeah, you got to make that money. Yeah, that's okay, a, that's whatever. Big, yeah, well, DJs make more money than musicians. All vinyl. Yeah. yeah. Well, Trust. Well, that's, you have a car? I mean, lugging that shit around. Well, right? no. <laughs> oh. It's like my, donkey? The, <laughs> I, I always call it the donkey card because, yeah. you know, we sell merch on tour. But I mean, I'm selling the merch. I'm like, all right, the donkey card. <laughs> By the way, it reminds me when we were in when we were in Bogota I was doing a spoken word show and on the street came a woman a llama a goat and a child and I fell right at home I'm just saying <laughs> maybe they were goat people I, don't know I, I almost got you a goat I'm sorry, I almost I'm got you a goat in Mexico you, because you know the story that I fell in love with a goat one night I had a dream that I fell in love with a goat. Oh, boy. <laughs> and the goat was the most fetching. I could only say he was fetching. He was kind of white blonde hair. He sat like a man crossed his legs. And I never felt more love for a human than I felt for this goat. Beautiful blue eyes. And I just woke up and said, I fell in love with a goat. I need to cover my own so song insane. and change it. Two days later, Jasmine Hurst, our psychic friend and mm-hmm. part of our coven, said she saw my goat. I'm like, what do you mean you saw my goat? In Montauk, she photographed it. I said, my goat is real. I fell in love with a goat. I never loved a man like I loved this goat in my dream. I'm just saying. And then you, I know you wanted to bring me a goat. What, live curried stuff? No, li- no, I wanted to get it at the market. I wanted to rescue it from a uh, Santeria goat sacrifice. Rescue. Honey, I'm not even going to have a place to live in a few weeks. What would I do with a damn goat? Put it over my shoulders? I mean, I need a donkey. I need the donkey cart. Forget the goat. I do love donkeys, though. I don't did, mean did you in ever the biblical see the Bre- Bresson movie, O oh, Azar Baltazar? I have that not. Really depressing. Is it about film. a goat? It's about the life of Christ, but okay. it's a donkey. And all is, these is terrible Christ things all these terrible things happen to it. Have you ever met a donkey? Oh, in Mexico it's full of, of course. Full of bur- burros. Yeah. Um in, in Spain, when I was living in Barcelona, every Christmas there'd be three donkeys. I live near the Santa I live near live near um uh, Sagrada Familia, mm-hmm. the Gaudi Cathedral. Mm-hmm. And there'd be three donkeys mm-hmm. there for children to ride on. And, okay, I had another donkey friend. So I did a lot of um, filming and photographing in Belchite, mm-hmm. where Franco bombed in 1937, killing all 6,000 6, people. And there was a shepherd with a thousand... There was a shepherd with a hundred goats and sheep and one donkey. Mm -hmm. But the donkey would remember me because I'd go there every summer and fall to photograph or take videos for backdrops for my spoken word shows. But the donkey would always come and have to give you a little head nudge. They're beautiful animals. I want to They're have very a, sensitive animals. If I ever have money, I'm going to start a, a sanctuary rescue? in Mexico. Yeah, oh. totally. Can I have a mini donkey? I've always wanted a mini donkey. But I mean, I couldn't carry much merch on a mini donkey. I'm just saying. Maybe I'll be in Mexico with a mini donkey and a couple of CDs. I don't know. The future You know, the Chinese, now, now there's a trade in, in something from donkey skins. And they've yeah. killed all the donkeys in China and they're going to Africa now. Oh, there's, okay. there's a donkey so slaughterhouse. Like, gives them boners a donkey, or something? A donkey are, slaughterhouse now. Okay, I oh have to God. say, I just saw, by Chinese, I just saw on the news today, Pablo Escobar mm-hmm. had his own zoo. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, Giraffes. the hippos. Well, now the hippos yeah. have gone wild. There were no 
whatever hippos in Colombia. Oh, he imported two hip four hippos. Now there are more than fifty. And you know, hippos are one of the most dangerous oh, animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, more no, people are killed. Are terrified oh, yeah. of them. More people yeah, yeah. are killed by hippos than oh, any yeah. other animal in the wild. Yeah. So now they have escaped the. Um, now it's uh, Pablo Escobar's uh, homestead is now a, a amusement park mm-hmm. with hippos featuring. But there are fifty wild hippos terrorizing the locals. Yeah. And to sterilize them is very expensive. How do you sterilize a hippo? Oh, I don't God. even want to know. I'm just saying. <laughs> Terrified. Hippos, not happy. Oh, wow. Hungry, hungry, hungry hippos. Oh, my God. Not my favorite animal. I mean, that one tooth, that shark blade of a tooth, oh, yeah, that, it's a good giant that sword. hatchet, yeah. that sword. Uh, thanks, you don't Pablo. Stand a chance. And they can run Thank like you, Pablo Escobar, for an another hour. great deed yeah, done. They're, for they're very, the females are very. So, Colombia, which of their never young. had a hippo. Now has 50 wild hippos. I mean, I think it's, and I know quite a few people that have, and we wouldn't be here if we weren't, but I think it's highly unethical to have a child. I just think that I'm, I have, I'm sorry, I have to interject that. Like, I'm for human rights, animal rights, women's rights, men's rights, trans rights, everybody's rights. Uh, And it's not children I have a problem with. It's usually their mothers. Now, I don't have a problem with you. What made you decide so much work that you do do and have to do and how hard your work is to have this child because that is 18 years or more of extra work honey and who bears the brunt and who bears the burden is the women now why was this child calling to you from the other side it was an experience i wanted to have i i'm definitely no not childbirth the the child (laughs) the, the child you know, it's like getting your ears pierced and then you get to wear earrings the rest of your life. Like, no, it was about a... No, Honey, the <laughs> hole that a child comes out is bigger than the one that pierced your ears. <laughs> no, I wanted to have the experience. You know, I met a man that I wanted to do that with and it's a magical experience. Like, I feel children are, are wonderful. They're, I love children. You know, they um, love me. I can stop know, children I, from crying, I, you know. Two I seconds. have a problem with people having lots of children. You know, I think... Overpopulation well, is carbon, at the root footprint. of like all the problems in the world um, and religion. Do you think it was just, I mean, was it your desire or was it your hormones talking? Because, you know, women, I mean, shoot out your biological oh, no, it time wasn't, clock, It wasn't my hormones. Like, I was, I was, amb- I was ambivalent until, you met the, until right person. I, the day that she was born and then suddenly you it was... Wait, you were ambivalent was like, for nine months of pregnancy? Well, I hated being pregnant. Who doesn't? Yeah. Well, some people don't because they do it over and over again. Did you yeah, have any so, postpartum stuff? I mean, I have, no, no. I mean, I had a cesarean and I was on Percocet, but um, <laughs> but no. Can I, I didn't. just describe for one minute no, what a cesarean is? It's when they cut an evil smiley face in your belly, remove your uterus out of your body, and pull the shiny little happy need machine out and stitch you back up. That's a cesarean section. Now, I think it might be preferable. I wouldn't know because I'll never experience this. I feel if it doesn't fit in, it doesn't come out. That's my idea about childbirth. I can barely live in my body. Nothing else could, trust me. I have a hard time getting people to visit inside my body, and I don't blame them. Just saying. <laughs> no, I think, you know, there's people that should have children. There's people that shouldn't. And, exactly. You know, we do need good children <coughs> in the world. We do. We, we need good people in the world. We do need you good know? people. And, we need about six million you know, less, but we do need good people my, in the world. My daughter's... You know, she's a vegetarian. She loves animals. She She's very empathetic. If she sees another kid crying at the playground, she goes up and hugs them and asks oh, them what's that, the matter. No, that's you know? beautiful. Like, she's, you know, we, we do need children like that yes, in the world. Yes, we do. You know? No, absolutely. I'm just against, theoretically, philosophically, yeah. and ethically, the concept of procreation. I'm not saying, but who am I? Am I going to choose who should have children? No, because I think mass sterilization and free vasectomies for all should be the call of the day for a while. Now, I know that there's a lot of people in our generation that have had children, and some of them good and some of them not so good. Yeah. I just fear don't like either of their parents. I know mm-hmm. about three people that like both of their parents. How do you know? I mean, you're taking a big, you are, this is a crapshoot. Mm-hmm. Or as, I, as the New York City subway used to say, it's like being grounded for 18 years. But not if you don't feel that way because women do three times as much work as most men anyway. So what is it? Child labor, having a kid, watching it for 18 years, cooking, cleaning, uh, making a couple of documentaries and a couple thousand lectures or films. No biggie. We're women, right? Yeah. So I mean, you know. You know, I feel That's like... That's what we do. We give life. You're not sweating. I, you know, I feel like from eight, 17, 18, 19 to 39 when I had my daughter, like those 20 years, my life was pretty much variations on a theme. I was working on different projects. I was 
going out with different guys. I was, you know, hanging out with different people. But it was essentially the same lifestyle, the same thing. And I felt ready to have a completely new experience. I just hope that, or I see that sometimes having a child or getting married, which I'm also against, unless it's for a green card or a lot of money, because I think love does not mean a piece of paper to confirm it or confirm it, that they're always, that I don't want anything that's going to prevent anyone from having new experiences. And sometimes people get locked into a prison of a false tradition, which is a trap. And I mean, I'm really, I I don't understand why so many people have so many traditional ideas about, oh, I'm going to get married. Well, for money, a green card, oh, love, are you kidding kidding me? But you can do traditional things in a non-traditional way. Yeah, you can. You know, know, where most of them are going to end in the same way. If you're a creative person. Things end quite often. There is a trajectory for certain traditions, which if you do not have complete faith in, blind and dumb faith, are going to end in a very predictable way, which is disappointment, frustration, divorce, and uh, separation. Once when I was about 10, I think, you know, I got home from school and Luis Buñuel and his wife were having lunch at my house with my parents. And my parents who didn't smoke, they were, you know, they were all like chain smoking. And I was at that age where I thought like if my parents had one cigarette, they were going to die. And I threw like this huge tantrum, like, why are you smoking? Who's this man that's making you smoke? You know, Luis Buñuel hated children. I'm sure this is like one of the reasons why. Five years later, I was smoking and watching his movies and, and being like, oh, Luis Buñuel. But, but yeah, like I grew up, my father was also good friends with Khodorovsky. And, you know, I, was, I grew up with sort of all these filmmakers and artists and, and writers. Khodorovsky, and, I mean, um, Santa Sangre is one of my favorite films. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of his films, they were banned or they were not available. Holy Mountain, mm-hmm. El Topo. The failed Dune project. And he became then a tarot reader and a cartoonist. But I did a show with him, Exine Cervank and I, when we were in a rude hieroglyphic store in Olympia, Washington. And we were doing spoken word, and he was showing, I think, El Topo or Magic Mountain, which hadn't been shown in a long time. And he was absolutely convinced and fascinated that we were lesbians. I mean, like, part-time occasionally, yes. (laughs) And he said if I showed him my tattoos, he would give me a three-card tarot reading, and he did. And he's just one of the most special people on the yeah. planet. Underrated forever. And Santa Sangre, which if people haven't seen it, I mean, holy blood, holy blood. Just one of the most visually arresting, poetic, um, bruising films yeah. with an amazing soundtrack as well. And, and and often starring his family. And he's just, he's of his own tribe. Yeah. I mean, when we speak about people like Man Ray or Yadorovsky, I mean, or Herzog, I mean, these are people that fought against all odds to yeah. create things that were absolutely incredible that hold up through yeah. time and that have inspired countless other people. But still, the general population has no idea. Yeah. And part of it is just the lack of access, especially, yeah. you know, even Santa Sangre, which I think was maybe his most successful film. Yeah, you know, he, I don't, he had I don't so know many Netflix, years hello. up until recently where like 20 years where he was just living in Paris with his Vietnamese wife and he couldn't make films. So he was just writing po- poetry. Yeah. And he said, you know, poetry to me is the purest art form because only other poets read poetry. Thank you, you know? very much. <laughs> Look, I have a, There's no market. <laughs> I have a poetry oh, no. book that in for, they've been trying to translate for eight years in France. The Czechs did it in three weeks. I won't release it in America because who fucking cares? Only other poets. Yeah. You've been listening Listening to the Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl. Thank you very much. Thank you.